practitioners have had, have had one of those days at the end of your week, and every single patient that comes into you says, I don't feel good, this isn't working, I don't know what I'm doing, why am I listening to you? I think you're crazy because this really isn't working and you're making me move out of my house. And you sit there at the end of your last day of the week thinking, well, what the heck am I doing and does this work? So that's what I'm gonna talk about today because I don't think enough practitioners talk about the difficulty in treating SERS patients. So a little bit about my practices because they're probably different than yours. I do practice in two states, so I go back and forth to California. I'm primarily based in Montana. So of the 439 patients that I've seen in the past five years, I will say there are more than that, but I did not dig through the paper records. So this is what I have seen just with uh, electronic records. Yay, it makes data collection a lot easier. So general patients, I only see in Montana, it's about a quarter of my population. Three quarters of my population are SERS patients. Of those, 83% or 261, 83% are active, and 56 are inactive. We're going to talk a little bit about why they became inactive patients. Um, most of those are in Montana, and some in California, obviously. I'm not there as much, so I think that's the lower number. And of my patients in Montana, 10% actually came from general wellness patients that I was able to see the pattern of SERS and actually talk to them about, hey, okay, I think this might be what's going on, and go through the entire process. So here's a little bit more. 58% of my patients are SERS patients in Montana, 42 general wellness. 20% live locally, and I'll say locally in Montana is 100 miles. It's a big state. Um, 80% are greater than 100 miles. 80% are out of the state, okay? And of my California patients, most of them are local to California. I do have patients all over the world. I have a South African patient, two in the UK, two in Canada. This is the view out of my window, so people ask me, why in the heck are you in the middle of Bozeman? This is why. <laughs> and I really like to be skiing. They just got two feet of powder last night. Um, oh, this is jumpy. There we go. So patients by age, this actually matches what Dr. Shoemaker presented two days ago. The mean age of my patients is 43, and predominantly female, 76%. This probably looks a little bit different for Scott. Um, I don't do a lot of pediatrics. They don't travel well. So mean duration of illness before getting to my office, 11 years but that spanned from six months to over 45 years, lifelong illness. The mean number of providers before getting to me was nine. So that spanned from two to 30 and above. I stopped counting at 30. And patients diagnosed with tick-borne illness accounted for 30% of my patients who got to me. And of those, 46% had been diagnosed with Igenex. Previous diagnoses, a little bit different than what Dr. Shoemaker provided for you two days ago, but fatigue, overwhelmingly, 50% of my patients had fatigue, and then on down the line. So these are the top 15 um, symptom clusters. Respiratory included things like asthma, COPD, cough, shortness of breath. Um, endocrine disorders included infertility, um, PCOS, diabetes type one, um, hypoglycemia was in there as well and cardiovascular disorders, so pericarditis, um, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, POTS, things like that. And then autoimmune, I also put in there just a generalized abnormal ANA. How many of our patients say, hey, I saw a rheumatologist and they say someday I will have some sort of autoimmune condition. So they're clumped into there. When we look at exposure stats, all of my patients have been exposed to mold. So that's definitely the big gun there. A third has been exposed to tick-borne illness with positive hygienic testing. Um, a third has probable red tide and toxic algae exposure. So when we're talking about that, I have lots of patients who go to hot springs. I have lots of patients who go to the ocean and get exposed to red tide. In California, where I'm at, there's tons of um, different algal balloons in the rivers there. The Yuba River just had one, Lake Shasta just had one last year. So those are in our patient populations. I have one patient with ciguatera exposure from the Caribbean, and one patient with positive illness after ground recluse spider bite. 
when we look at gold, when we have 70% uh, of patients are getting exposed at home, 12% of patients are getting exposed at work, 33% of school age children, that's anything, anybody who's in school, including college, and then many of my patients have multiple exposures, so 30% at home and work, and 26% at home and school. I did not look at other exposures, like family members' houses or churches, which is a huge exposure source. This is where I stay when I go to my other clinic, so I get to be in Tahoe, not bad. And this is pre-treatment treatment stats, very similar to Dr. Shoemaker's presentation a couple days ago. Average symptom score, 28, and you can kind of see the breakdown of tests and the percentage of positives based on each test. So I also wanted to look at, of my patients, what happens with each exposure step, so, or each treatment step. So does the Shoemaker protocol work is the question I wanted to answer. So with exposure, of those patients who just got out of exposure, that's all they did, there was a 10% overall symptom improvement. 15% of those patients actually reported a worsening of symptoms with removing from exposure, which I thought was interesting. Um, with cholesterol, on my notes, um, there was about a 15% decrease um, in symptom um, reporting, and that was 16% of patients who actually reported symptoms getting worse. This is post um, CSM treatment, so not at the beginning. Most of my patients tell me they feel worse when they first start. And interestingly, also, removing from exposure, the VCS test did not get better. Once they were through cold staggering, that's when we started to see the visual contrast sensitivity test flip. With Marcon's 25% symptom reduction, and 12% of patients said that they had a worsening of symptoms. And then we get into the kind of the big guns with doing low amylose diet and high dose fish oil um, and anti inflammatory herbs. MMP9 we saw a 46% reduction in symptom reporting. That's huge, right? And VIP, 64%, okay? And only 4% of patients said that they felt worse with VIP in my clinic. So overall, symptoms um, were going from 28 to 15. That's a 33% reduction in symptoms. So I would say that this protocol works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's get it. So, what causes patients to stop treatment? I wanted to look at those patients and figure out, well, why the heck did they stop? Overwhelmingly, 22 of those patients stopped because they felt better and they didn't want to continue. They're tired, they've been sick for 11 plus years, somewhere between two and 45. They don't want to keep doing this. They're back to work, they're back to actually um, being with their families and living their life, so they stop. 19 stopped because they couldn't or would not get out of exposure. So that could be things like, hey, we moved 16 times, like the patient we heard from yesterday. Or that could also be things like, my daughter goes to school in a moldy school, and I don't want to change her life. So I'll come back to you in 18 years, and hopefully they're doing OK. Or it's folks that just didn't have the oomph to keep going, which we do have those. Eight of those patients had financial constraints. Four transferred care to the doctors who were local to them. As we get more practitioners, I like transferring patients to a local doc. You can see them every day. It's great. Um, pregnancy three, I would say this is a win. Came to me for infertility what issues and ended up pregnant, so I will take that win. And one patient actually was diagnosed with breast cancer and stopped treatment. So I did want to share with you a case study, and this is a patient that started with me pretty close to when I started treating SIRS. So HL is a 53-year-old Caucasian female. She had chest pain. That's really all that she was coming in for that I know of. From 2014 to 15, she was having repeat bouts of chest pain, pericarditis, pleuritis, and ammonia. Every time she went to the ED, she was treated with IV, antibiotics, and prednisone, and given a prednisone taper after. They didn't know what to do with her. In December 2015, she had five days of chest pain that was escalating, and they ended up diagnosing her with pericarditis, pleuritis, atelectasis, pericardial effusion, and pneumonitis. So the hospital said, we have absolutely no clue what's going on with you. You've been in and out of here how many times? Um, and we think it's probably an autoimmune condition. 
on the uh, records that I reviewed, there was really nothing in the physical exam. A little fever, slight distress, obviously. Her EKG was abnormal, her echo was abnormal, her thoracentesis was normal. Blood work, some abnormalities, including elevated ESR and CRP. Um, infectious disease was called in. We have one infectious disease specialist in the state of Montana, and so he had to drive a couple days to get to where she was, um, and everything was negative. And a rheumatologist was also flown in. Um, she was in rural Montana, and the rheumatologist only tested for anti-Smith antibodies. I'm not sure why, but that's all he did, and then he flew away. <laughs> The patient was finally discharged because she was stable and had no answers to the cause of what was going on. She had seen 11 plus practitioners, two naturopaths. Um, she continues to see a cardiologist from Washington State. She saw another infectious disease specialist, another rheumatologist, a, a neurologist, a gastroenterologist, and an acupuncturist and a counselor. So that's a lot. Um, and that was just in the time she was dealing with this, so in the past couple of years. She saw her local naturopath who knew of me and referred her to my office saying, well, I don't know that doctor deals with some weird stuff, go see her. <laughs> so I spent three hours in an intake with her. That is typical for me, I'm a cash-based practice, so I can do that. I can spend the time to actually figure out what's going on. And her review of systems was very different than what I saw in her medical records. So she had positive symptoms, in every single body system, pretty much. I would say Durham, not so bad, right skin. But her biggest complaints, obviously, the chest pain, but she couldn't focus at work. She was having neurocognitive disorder symptoms happening. So she couldn't focus, she couldn't read a book, she couldn't manage her employees, anything like that. She's a lawyer, a contract lawyer, and travels throughout Montana, and owns her own law firm, and she did have a life stress at the time. She's married to a rancher, that's why she's often in rural Montana instead of Bozeman. And she married him about three years prior and had been spending more and more time at the ranch. She has a standard American diet and exercise is pretty non-existent. She likes to get on her horse when she can, but pretty much she's housebound. She's on Nesta, Prednisone, Oxy, and a variety of supplements at this point. And physical exam, she did have an audible click at Herb's point. Her cardiologist said it, it was non-concerning. She was hyporeflexive and her Romberg was positive. So then we get into the exposure. She grew up in Montana. Lyme disease doesn't happen in Montana, right? Um, multiple tick bites, but infectious disease has ruled out tick-borne illness. She never had a history of an EM rash or flu-like illness after being bit by a tick. Toxic algae, she's on a lot of different ranches with settling ponds that turn fun colors, right? So possible exposure there. And mold, she has known mold exposures in her childhood homes, as well as in her last office building. She doesn't think there's a current issue in her house in Bozeman or in her office in Bozeman. But we started talking about the ranch. It's a homestead ranch, it was built in 1900. The newest building was built in 1918. So, and that's where she lives when she's there. We started asking more questions. When they irrigate, um, they have water running under their house. And when she walks into the house, it smells funny, almost like cat urine. So my red flags go up. Here's her past medical history, things she's been diagnosed with, and then subsequently undiagnosed with lupus. <coughs> And here's her baseline CIRS labs, symptoms for 30, everything else pretty much positive. MMP9 was always low, C3A, C4A normal. We also looked for cardiolipin antibodies, her ANA, since nobody had checked it in quite a while. Her TPOs and antithyroglobulin bodies were off the chart. Her EBD antibodies were off the charts, but her baseline labs that were abnormal at that emergency department visit actually had gone back down to normal. So I made her test because she didn't believe me that a weird smell in the house could mean mold, right? So her house in Bozeman was fine. Her office building in Bozeman was totally fine. But this is the ranch. So it hurts me too of an 18, and it's cut off there, but the Ermi is 4.26, I believe. 
So we talked about, hey, exposure, getting out of exposure, and also talked to her husband. He came in. He was not happy. He has a ranch. Nothing happens at the ranch. He can fix it by building another building, right? Or moving her to another building. Slowly, after probably a two-hour discussion, he became very open to talking to an IEP, and he did talk to some of the IEPs who are here today, as well as a local IEP in Montana. Who doesn't believe in this, by the way? Oops, backwards. So we discussed how do we get you out of exposure? It was easy for her. She could stay in Bozeman and not go to the ranch, even though that's hard on a relationship. Her husband attempted remediation three different times and then finally gave up. Um, she stayed in Bozeman. She started on binders. She had a really hard time getting on those binders, and but eventually was able to get up to the four doses a day. And her symptoms, remember they were 30, they dropped to 20. And her DCS test was still failing while she was on binders. In November of 2016, she went back to the ranch. She wanted to see her husband. And she immediately started having flu-like symptoms and chest pain. She ended up back in the emergency department. Again, they told her she's fine. Um, and her symptoms shot up to 27. We again talked about, hey, you can't do that. She got a trailer at the ranch for the time being so that she can have a place to stay when she, a safe place to stay when she goes there. And by February of 2017, that's a year later from when I met her, we started treating for marathons. So this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, and that's important to remember for all your patients. Um, luckily, she cleared it in one treatment round. That's pretty atypical in my clinic. Her symptoms dropped to 13, and she was packing her DCS test. Her MMP9 was never abnormal, so we never had to do the low amylose diet, but we did put her on an anti-inflammatory diet and basically cut her off of a standard American diet. And by um, May of 2017, we were ready to start the IP. TGF-1 went from 6,800 to 4,460 with a single dose of VIP, and her biotoxin symptoms after a month of VIP dropped to three. She started at 30, guys, that's huge. So again, she is bound to be re-exposed. She's a trial lawyer. She travels all throughout Montana in historic courthouses. We have plenty of them. So every time she gets exposed, she ends up with flu-like symptoms and heart pain, chest pain. Um, her CRP immediately goes up. That's not typical for a patient that I see with biotoxin illness. Every time she gets exposed, at least this time when she was admitted again, we pause on VIP, we don't pause anymore. Now she actually takes CSM prophylactically. But at this time, we paused on VIP, started CSM and well call until her symptoms went back to her baseline three. And then by January of 2018, um, all of her labs had gone back to normal. She's currently off all of those medications that she was on. She's barely on any supplements. She's able to do all of the ranching work. So she rides her horse pretty much every single day. She exercises every day. Um, she's expanding her law practice. Her brain works again. And she's a great example of doing the work yourself. Of even if you get the medical records, make sure you ask all of those questions and explore what's going on with the case. Because this is not a picture of what I would say, hey, yeah, okay, CIRS 90% of the time, I think you have it. This is a case of there was no review of systems from the hospital saying, hey, she has a multi-system, multi-symptom illness. We don't, we do know she has exposure, which is one of the pieces that I said, all right, let's talk about this. And she has a very atypical presentation, which is why I'm showing this to you. I have plenty of other patients who have atypical presentations. So my advice is to take the time and to ask the tough questions so that you get a full case history because more often than not, they're telling you all the answers and you don't have to search. And that's it. Thank you guys for your attention.